So I start off my presentations talking about this, which is the mission. Enable affordable access for everyone. It's super important. It's, um, uh, it's something which can be transformative for the way everybody in the other half of the world lives. And a lot of people in, in this room are from places where connectivity is challenging, where getting into the rural areas is a very difficult thing to do. And subsequently, schools and health centers and individuals just have no options. And so um, it's kind of fun being back here because I was here in 2009 and I introduced O3B. And uh, it was a new concept back then. And people would come to me from a lot of the Pacific Islands. they say, oh, wow, you know, we really could use this. We really want to, you know, could, could you come connect us? And I said, yeah, you're the reason we're doing it. And um, today I'm really happy to see the growth of O3B. I'm excited to see that over half of the islands are using the connectivity. It is complementary to all sorts of other methods of connectivity. Many of you bring those types to the people. But it's just been a fantastic system, and it's been a, a, a fantastic thing to watch because under Steve Collar, he's done a fantastic job of, of really growing that company, and, uh, and I just uh, am really proud of, of him and what they've been doing. So my history, a little bit about that. So I was, and some of you may, may have seen this, uh, I saw some of my friends from, from, from Africa. Um, I was in Africa helping to roll out, uh, actually building a telco, rolling out 3G and uh, fiber to the home. And I literally ran fiber. I thought fiber was it. It's got to be. Uh, I used some satellite, and satellite was slow and hard to configure and took a lot of, a lot of uh, money and time to, to, to make it work. And fiber, just once you put it in, it was so stable, and it was uh, very low latency. So I started rolling a lot of fiber and just literally doing it and building a 3G network. Of course, it sounds easier than it is because back then, and this is 2005, you go to a place, you put up a tower, and, well, it's a lot of money to put up a tower, it's a lot of cement, it's a lot of uh, rebar, it's a lot of uh, specialized skill sets, and then you don't have much, you don't have really good power. So then you have to put in generators, then you have to fill those generators. So then I thought we'd go to solar and actually built solar-powered uh, 3G towers. And it was really fun and had a local team and, uh, and, and really very rewarding. And these are the places that we covered. It didn't have many people, but a lot of people would say, hey, wait a minute, there's, there's no one there. And I'd say, no, there's, there's health centers and there's schools and there's, there's um, uh, 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 customs houses and courthouses and people who, who need things. And so that became a, um, a real lesson for me. But one of the problems that we had was we didn't have very good backhaul. All the backhaul came from over a geo satellite and it was high latency. So no matter how fast the internet was on the ground, it would still have that big long latency time back to, the, back to London and the rest of the world. So I ended up moving on and building O3B. And this is the satellites we designed and built and they're up and running. And uh, uh, that's been a lot, a, a lot of fun. Um, now, to take it a step further, uh, in a different area, in 2004, I went to the Weiss's conference. And uh, Weiss's said, this is all these different big agencies they got together in Tunisia. They said, OK, here are the two targets. Connect all villages with ICTs and connect all secondary and primary schools. And of course, I was a young and, and open-minded on it. and like, great, good, you guys are going to do all this stuff. It's fantastic. So let's look at 2015 targets review. Access to the internet in any form is extremely low for rural households in developing countries. So after all that, it, the problem was politically, you can get charged up and want to do something, but you can't mandate technology. It still is too expensive, or it has been too expensive, to reach the rural populations and bring a service that's affordable to the rural populations. So I thought about, how do we do that? How do we get all the schools connected? Because if that's, been, uh, that's the cornerstone of connectivity. Because people live within 10 kilometers of a school, pretty much everywhere in the world. So if you can use the school as a community access point, you can enable connectivity for everybody. So I started thinking about a terminal. How can we build a terminal that would have 50 megabits per second of low latency internet right for the school? that you could create LTE and 3G hotspot around the school that a high school age girl could install with no tools, that she could put up, unfold, turn on, get paid something for watching it, and that because it is an open and neutral network, all the operators could use it, and she would get a little roaming fee for when they use their, their, the infrastructure she's watching. Now, the terminal is the I'm not going to say the easy part, it's actually quite complex, but the terminal is only one piece of a much larger system. To make that work, had to build a satellite network around it. 
And so the OneWeb architecture, I, had a, a, I was fortunate to find that the KU spectrum was available. The, the previous uh, users had, of uh, SkyBridge had timed out, and so filed and acquired the, the priority spectrum rights in the KU spectrum and designed a system that would operate without interfering with the geos that could unlock that spectrum for use for which it's intended. Its intended use was to bring connectivity to the world. And so it was really important that we followed that intended use. So what you're seeing is 36 satellites in a plane, 18 orbital planes, about 1,200 kilometers, which gives us just about the right combination of latency and managing the orbital debris environment. So I'll show you a little video of how it works in case there's a, it, it, it really helps to understand it. You have um, a gateway, and the gateway puts the link, in a big, big link up to the satellite, and the satellite sends down a number of beams, and those beams go over the terminals. And as the beams change and the spectrum change, the terminals automatically change the spectrum that they're using. Now these chips in these terminals are really, really complex. In fact, people often ask me, you know, what's the hardest part of the system? And I'd say that the chips in the system are the hardest part. We're able to do uh, over 100,000 handovers a second without dropping packets. I mean, these are some really large-scale problems that we're dealing with. And so fortunately, Qualcomm is one of our major investors, and we'll talk a little bit about the chips that they're building uh, to, to make this happen because they're experts in handover. Uh, so there's 36 satellites in a plane, and then there are 18 planes, and you'll see how we, ha we uh, achieve global coverage. So the goal was to have a system that was simple enough for the end user that they could just put up a terminal and be done, and I'll show you some examples of where that goes. It looks big, there's a lot to it, We've really worked through all the pieces, and it's really wonderful to see, actually, all the teams that have come together around the world to help build this system, and all of the governments that have been so supportive of our mission. So we ordered 21 rockets, because we have to get them up there. Uh, I think it was the largest rocket order ever. And we start our first launches, actually, next year. And then in 2018, we have a campaign of Soyuz, and then we have 39 Virgin Galactic. Now, to put the 10 Soyuz in perspective, they launch on average about 15 to 25. Or if you look from year 2000 onwards, between 15 and 25 Soyuz is a year. So it's, we're not you know, putting them into a new paradigm of production, but you did have to order ahead and, and, and reserve this, because so, we have quite a few. So we come back to the terminal. We come back to the mission, the heart of the company and why we exist. Um, and then I'm going to show you some other terminals. So, we are a low latency system. Now, low latency is really important for user experience. Everybody knows that. But what it's also really important for is cellular backhaul. If you want to be between the core network and the eNode B, the terminal that your, your phone connects to, then you need to look like fiber. You need to have the latency of fiber and microwave. And it was really important that we met those, those latency requirements so that you can use, you can place small cells, even solar-powered small cells, integrated with LED street lamps all over the world. You just stick it there, and you're done. It, this one will see five kilometers up and down the road. You can cover roads across Australia. You can cover rural locations anywhere, and we don't have to do it. The end user, or I mean, the, the integrator can go and install along a bunch of roads and create coverage, all agnostic and neutral to the carrier. So it works with any carrier. Trains, we, mobility is built into our system. It's, it's naturally mobile. So high-speed internet to trains all around the world are, uh, is another market, because there's a very small terminal. I, I don't have a picture of the actual terminal, but the Rockwell Collins terminal is only an inch and a half thick. It's just a very small little thing about this big, and, I'll, uh, and it's, it's going very well. Um, but we'll work with all sorts of antenna manufacturers. Uh, this is a, a terminal on a barn. So you just put it on the barn. You run the cable inside if you have power. You have all the high speed, low latency connectivity you could want, whether it's voice or gaming or video conferencing. But you also get five bars of LTE connectivity. You'll get in your car. You'll have a great cell quality. You'll drive away, and it will hand over to the macro cell on the hill. So for rural populations where they have trouble with, with connectivity, they can, in fact, build their own networks. Coca-Cola, you may know, is, is an investor. And uh, they have uh, 20, over 25 million 
locations around the world where they are selling Coca-Cola products. I'm sure in all the islands that you deal with, you have Coca-Cola. And so this is a way of empowering these small distributors and resellers around the world and enabling them to have more products to sell while also creating and stimulating economic growth for the, for the local environment. So this is one of the conversations I've had with a lot of governments. They talk about number of household coverages covered. It used to be percentage of, of population covered, but we kind of have moved past that because everybody's got 90% of population covered. They cover all the cities and the suburbs around them. But what about the rest of the people or when they go home at night? Um, so coverage is easy and then it gets really hard, right? It's 50% is easy by industry or 60%. I was with one country and we were talking 57% covered by industry. They're putting 17 billion euro in to cover the next 23%. And after that, it's basically impossible. Right? The cost structure just goes asymptotically infinite. Uh, so one web lives here, right? How do we get all the rural populations covered? It's too expensive to run fiber, but you have to give them an equivalent performance to the fiber and cable modem. They have to be not second-class internet, but the same as everybody else if they want it, so they can participate. It's, we're learning a lot about the rural, even in developed countries, the issues with rural populations. They're leaving the rural areas, coming to the cities when they don't have internet access. So I'll tell you something else that's kind of interesting, I think you, you might appreciate, is first responder. So this is a terminal that sits on top of a truck. So this is a fire truck. You're in the fire truck, you have your cell phone, it works. When you drive away and the cell tower falls down, doesn't work for some reason, the terminal actually senses the cell tower is gone it starts up and creates an LTE bubble around your truck. So the firefighters and all the first responders will always have connectivity, even if all the cell towers fall away. Super important, as many of you know, to keep communications going in times of disaster. And this is a, a major th a point for OneWeb, is our ability to maintain assured and continuous communications. And there'll be a small terminal. Another cool aspect, again, we're way off satellite right now, is that it's a self-organizing network. When a bunch of vehicles get together, they actually create a new network, millisecond by millisecond. You can walk from one side of the network here all the way to the other, and you'll hand over from truck to truck, because for that millisecond, that's the cell network. Aircraft, this is actually not the terminal. There's actually a, a, the new terminal, which is not displayed here, but um, there's 35,000 new aircraft coming in over the next 20 years. You, uh, we have uh, Airbus as an investor, um, so we know a lot about aircraft and a lot about their needs. Uh, so we'll be able to provide very, very high-speed bandwidth on a global basis, pole to pole. We we'll work closely with our partner, Intelsat, to ensure that we have pole to pole coverage and we can move between our systems. So you're actually on, when you're on OneWeb, you're also on the Intelsat Epic and you can move back and forth seamlessly. So latency, latency, latency. I talk about it a lot. It's really, in 2009, no one thought about it, and now it's become pretty, pretty high up on people's uh, agenda uh, for high quality communications. Um, 36,000 kilometers, we're at 700 milliseconds. We bring it into 8,000, we're at 130. Fantastic. For all web activities, you're really moving into the territory where you're equal to everybody else, who are able to, and able to perform all the cloud-based applications. At 1,200, we move, back to 30, we move down to 30 milliseconds. I don't think that's enough, but it's where we are. I'll tell you why. If you look at an LTE stack of connectivity between your cell phone and the cell tower, you're going user equipment, to the cell tower, to the mobility management entity. And there's a whole bunch of back and forth that your cell, your cell phone does as you drive down the road and negotiates with that tower and then goes over to the next tower. And if you add it all up, the stacks of communications, 80 millisecond average. So you really fumble the whole system if you try to put 700 milliseconds in the middle. I mean, you, you can't have the handover of small cells or even large cells in, any, in the reasonable, seamless manner that's, that's necessary for an operator. And remember, OneWeb is designed to be in the middle of a cellular network. We built the satellite, tested it out. Our satellites are small. You guys like satellites, about 150 kilograms each. We've got a modem board. And the modem board has those all-important chips on it. And that gives us capacity to uh, talk to the antennas and then out to uh, uh, out by Ethernet and other feature sets into the, into the world and into the local population. 
investment. It takes a lot of money to build a system like this, for sure. And we've been very fortunate to have a board and to have investors that are uh, caring, are thoughtful, have seen the world, and understand the impact and importance of the internet. From uh, Sunil Mittal, who's on our board, who's founder of Bardi Airtel, which is the third largest telecom in the world, uh, Richard Branson, who many of you know from Virgin and Aircraft and Mo Virgin Mobile, and Steve Spengler from, from Intelsat, uh, Qualcomm, and Paul Jacobs is on the board, and then Tom Enders from Airbus. So we've got a very wide and diverse investor base that includes chip manufacturing all the way into manufacturing of components into uh, uh, customers and then financial. So there's the whole gamut of investors in, in the system. And we announced our first, uh, it was over $500 million of round in, in June uh, of this year. So we come back to the system and what we're building. This is just giving you guys an overview of what we're doing and kind of where we are. So the question is always, as we start out, how do you enable connectivity for everyone? And the answer that we have is empower the communities to build their own networks. So OneWeb is about empowering communities, giving them the tools so they can build their own cellular footprint, they can get their own internet in all the nooks and crannies and locations. And those two million schools that we want to connect, that is the mission of the company to have that happen, we want to enable the people in the school to bring their own connectivity and solve that problem globally for themselves. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions, if there are any, any questions. I know, uh, I don't know if they're texted up or not, but I, I'm not sure what the timing is right now because there's no clock. It just says 16.30. Is it? Hello? Question? Um, thank you. That was fascinating and an interesting example of one more solution for developing regions. Do you foresee the customers being in, in the rural communities being end users, such as a school or a community, or do you foresee working through operators, providers that are already in the country, or it's both? It's an excellent question, One, and, I, and I didn't address that, and I should have. OneWeb is not designed to be a retail operator. So people will not buy OneWeb uh, services. The, the uh, uh, telcos, the ISPs of the, of the country, will actually buy the services and resell them. So it will be white labeled retail where a telecom operator will place a terminal on the roof and the person will buy the services through the local telecom operator. Well, that assumes first that they have an incentive to provide the service and in some countries they're not so interested and also the, the price differential between what you propose and what they mark up could be significant too. Well, we hope, we hope it's not, but we'll work with many operators. So, and we'll also work with new, new ISPs. So we hope to see, uh, to make it easy enough that new ISPs can be formed and that many operators can participate and bring the services uh, to their communities. So hopefully that, uh, that will keep the price low where it should be. And one more and then I think we have to go. Uh, could you give Armand Musi from Summit Ridge Group, could you give us a little bit of an update on the financing of the system and also uh, whether your success with O3B, and, which is now starting to lower the price of satellite capacity, is actually perhaps making it more difficult to raise money for OneWeb because the, the you know, satellite capacity pricing is uh, sort of coming down. Interesting. Let me think about those two questions. So on the financing, um, we closed our round uh, a while ago. And we, uh, we will be opening another round. I, I don't have a date as to when it will open up. Um, but uh, we're doing a combination of, of financing mechanisms, including ec new equity plus some combination of debt. Uh, but we, we have that going on on one thing. We have a new CEO, Matt O'Connell, who's leading the charge of the equity raise on, on that, although I'm obviously continuing to be involved. Um, then regarding the, uh, the second question, O3B, I'm glad to hear that their success is driving connectivity. That's, uh, it hasn't actually come up, the idea that their price, the price drop they're creating is a problem. It's actually, it's been the other way around. People have been happy because of O3B's success. Um, and I actually like to see prices come down. 
I like to see prices become more affordable. I'd like to see more connectivity and everybody here continue to invest and drive more connectivity into these regions because that will actually come back and pay us dividends because you'll see explosive economic growth as more connectivity gets into these locations and they'll hunger for more connectivity and it just pays and pays and pays back on itself. So um, I'm really, I'm happy to hear that they're driving the price down and I'm happy to, to see the growth of the economies where they're, where, where they're having an effect. So it hasn't, it's been positive, I, I, I think. Um, but thank you everybody, I really appreciate your, your time.